Welcome everyone. We're glad to have you join us on today's securityboulevard.com webinar. We had a really exciting topic. The topic is threats at the kitchen table, balancing security and usability in remote workforces. Very timely topic, of course. Uh, today's webinar is sponsored by Immersive Labs. My name is Mitch Ashley. I'm here to be your host and moderator. A few housekeeping items we want to take care of. We are recording the webinar and an email with a link to that recording will be sent to all participants who registered for the webinar. The good news is no slides to download. This is all interactive stuff. I think you're going to really enjoy it. We're also giving away four, uh, inter four gift cards at the end, Amazon gift cards that are $25 each. So stick around and find out if you're one of our winners. Now, I know our two speakers presenter, well, presenters probably not the right issue. Our two, two guys that are doing this webinar today <laughs> are really are, are very interactive, love questions, and would appreciate the questions that you have. If there's some that we might cover along the way, we'll insert those, and we'll certainly have some time at the end to cover questions you might have. Well, let's move on to our topic. Threats at the kitchen table, balancing security and usability in remote workforces. It's my pleasure to introduce our two speakers, Chris Pace, who is Technology Advocate with Immersive Labs, and Paul Bentham, who is Chief Product Officer at Immersive Labs. Well, gentlemen, I'm going to step away and go make myself some beans and mashers and uh, mushrooms and, you know, good, good English breakfast while you guys are doing this. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Chris. Thanks, Mitch. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon and good morning. Um, it's our pleasure to be uh, presenting this uh, this webinar on uh, threats at the kitchen table. As uh, Mitch said, this uh, will take a slightly different approach to perhaps maybe webinars that you've been familiar with. There are no slides. Um, we'll be moving through um, what what we would define as a crisis scenario, essentially a, a tabletop uh, exercise that we'll be um, using our uh, cloud platform to, to go through. Um, you will also be able to offer uh, your input uh, into how we make our decisions by playing along. Um, you can do that by going to uh, you see the, the URL at the top of the screen, my, my shared screen here. You can go to play.immersivelabs.online and the exercise code there, D88FE8, that will um, log you into the companion website where you'll be able to uh, give your own um, input into, into how, we should, uh, how we should move forward in the scenario. Um, and so that's basically how the, the whole thing will work. The URL and the exercise code will stay there uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the presentation. Uh, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and start the exercise, and this will basically tell us the situation that we find ourselves in, who we are, and the company that we that we work for. And then after this, it will move us into the first part of the of the scenario. So I'll go ahead at this point and read through the overview so that we can see um, what's the situation that we find ourselves in. Current world events mean more organizations are transitioning to a remote working model. But how do we do this while balancing cybersecurity needs with business operations and efficiency? In this scenario, a pandemic hits the world and it soon, become, soon becomes clear that your company must transition to a fully remote workforce. However, many of your employees have never worked remotely before. You need to prepare for this eventuality and balance business productivity with your security. We predominantly use the Office 365 suite of applications. 48% of our IT budget is ring-fenced for necessary operations, and the remainder is available for ad hoc projects. And you can see here that we are the head of IT at a management consulting firm called Wealthasive that works with high profile individuals to oversee their financial activities and investment strategy. Our role as head of IT also encompasses, in this case, cybersecurity, which is obviously um, you know, common in, in uh, many, many organizations. Okay, so let's just see uh, how many folks we've got. Okay, I'm going to fair few logged into the website there. Just a reminder that URL at the top and the exercise code where you can go and join in to answer this first 
this first uh, question. The severity of the pandemic is becoming apparent. An emergency executive meeting is called and the team decides that new remote working guidance must be created ASAP. HR, legal and your own IT team all provide some input and three options are drawn up. This information will be distributed to all employees to ensure their work from home setup is secure. So at this point we have, um, I think three different, essentially three different types of remote working uh, a policy that we need to share with our with our employees. The first one looks fairly standard, or maybe is our existing remote working policy. The second one looks like it explains more some of the actual practicalities of working remotely, but that's it's extremely short. And the third one, oh, this looks like a thing downloaded from the internet. Okay, so what are our options? So option one, writing a dedicated remote working policy for the pandemic is the best thing to do. Option two, this option is already written by our organization and has the correct information included. Or option three, a well-researched professional option from online. So I'm gonna open up um, the, the ability for you to now give your thoughts about the route that we should, the route that we should take here. So either it's a dedicated uh, policy for the pandemic. It's an option that we've already that we already have written, or it's a well-researched um, one from uh, online. So, Paul, what are we what are we thinking? What's the what's the best what's the best route to take here? Well, it's it, like it's really interesting. It's kind of reassuring in some ways that as an organisation we'd already considered remote working. I know, like. It, during the recent pandemic, a lot of people sort of had a bit of a panic and did a digital transformation overnight. Uh, but this mm. company has obviously thought about this ahead of time and has got that kind of nice generic uh, remote working policy. So in many respects, you kind of would hope that that first uh, policy kind of covers all eventualities and it's just like, get off the shelf, dust it off a bit and you know, off, you're off to the races. So you how, confident would be... are we, how confident are we that the one we already created is going to cover all the eventualities of a pandemic, given that most people were working at the office up to now? And I think that's the key thing, isn't it? We had a remote working policy, which was like one or two people, one or two days a week. It's mm. not all the people all the time and dealing yeah. with all of that. And I think risk, the balance of risk has changed. Like now it's you can't work unless you can work remotely. So we need a policy that allows people to work while staying safe and secure online whilst they're working off their ironing board or in their kitchens. Uh, um, so two's got to be pretty tempting here. I think three, I can't imagine three. Three might help us inform two, but I don't think there's ever going to be a scenario where we just be like, Google good remote working policies, download that and, and implement it. I can't see that. I think unless it had been written, unless it had been written explicitly for the pandemic, um, I think that would be different. So if we basically were looking at, a, you know, this is a policy that's been crafted if you're not doing remote working but now you need to that deals with you know most of the issues that you would face if you were going through a pandemic I think that would be potentially viable but what we looked at I don't think was that it looked like it was mm -hmm. something very formulaic and, and generic so I think we have to dedicate that it feels like we have to dedicate the time um, and yeah, go with true. option one really uh, well yeah option two you mean but we'll see what the yeah. um I think the key thing is that the risk appetites changed mm. No, like we we will yeah. take more risk than we would have previously because it's against the backdrop of not being yeah. able to work at all. Yeah. So what do, what what are you leaning towards? Well, I'm thinking I'm leaning towards uh two. The one oh, that no, we already have. Oh, no, no, yeah. sorry, yeah, no, sorry, no, the dedicated remote working. Sorry, the, 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 the different order to I oh sorry. Okay. Well we got fifteen responses uh here Super from the uh, from the audience. So let's see what we have. Yeah, so the, the majority are with us. I'm going to go with uh, option one. Now you'll notice, um, to step away from the scenario for a second, you'll notice now what we're the button that we're going to press is show impact. Um, and what that means is that we have on, on the right hand side of this scenario, we have the impact on various uh, factors that is being made by the decisions that we by the decisions that we make. So you can see here um, an increase in operational effectiveness due to taking that. Um, due to taking that approach, an increase in, secu in security posture due to taking that approach, 
IT budget staying IT budget staying flat. And I think one of the challenges that we're definitely um, you know going to um, going to be dealt during this scenario is the the potential budget impact. It, I don't think it's a coincidence that the budget was mentioned at the beginning. I think there's an impact on budget that we are going to have to consider as we move through this as we move through this scenario because it, there isn't a bottomless pit of a there isn't a bottomless pit of money and b given our industry we also know there's a there is the potential that our business is actually being impacted by the pandemic um by the pandemic as well we don't know the impact that it's going to have on the economy um so that's just a thing to to bear it to bear in mind so essentially these um these indicators that you can see on the right hand side they adjust based on the decisions that we that we make. That's one thing that can happen. The other thing that can happen is the narrative itself, the story can go in a particular direction based on the route that, that we choose, the way we decide to answer a particular challenge. Um, so the, the, this is kind of a an evolving uh, scenario, if you like, um, that we really don't know which route we may end up, we may end up going down. Okay. So the rapid spread of the pandemic means it's likely staff will soon have to work from home. A second executive meeting discusses the issue of maintaining device security. Your policy includes guidance on personal devices, but there is unease about the risk that this will introduce. Executives defer to you as head of IT for a procedure. You will need to balance security and cost as the new devices will come out of the IT budget. What do we do? So. We have option one, which is order new devices for everyone. Wow, that does sound expensive. But everyone <laughs> needs a correctly configured company device. Option two, order devices for staff with the most access to valuable data. Or option three, don't buy any new devices. Everyone is allowed to use their personal devices. Uh, what are your immediate thoughts, Paul? <laughs> I do, I'm take, I've got post-traumatic stress from having this uh, exact problem before. Um, this is a this is such a complicated question. So it plays into the kind of security of BYOD down and bottom as option three. Like, and we are an Office 365 organization after all. So it could you could easily argue, well, just you know, use your own phone, use your own laptop. Of course, uh, that's. I mean, that's not ever going to play in if you're the CISO here. I mean, from an IT perspective, maybe it's very expensive to mm. order everyone. And we saw during the first phase, especially in the UK, I don't know whether this happened uh, in other countries, but supply chain on laptops just evaporated. You know, I, there were companies, you know, older sort of more sluggish companies were having to buy people laptops at, you know in overnight and they just mm. couldn't get hold of them there just wasn't the supply chain for them and before you even consider the budget and how you look, put the images on them set up your security software configure it all etc cetera, etc cetera. I mean, we haven't. So we we could explore variables here. I mean, one of the things about uh, one of the things about an exercise is it obviously encourages us to think creatively about what are the other variables that might be at play. We could say that we, we maybe we would go maybe we would go for option three with the caveat that we think there are, is a way of managing you know personal mobile devices that would mean we had some you know some some control there so if a device was lost it could be wiped or we have control over what they can access through that phone so we could throw in that as a variable maybe we don't buy new devices but we look to make an investment in software that would help um, secure personal devices which would definitely be cheaper but the the other side of that coin is then your kind of installing a company thing on a on a oh, personal device, nice. which potentially yeah. opens a whole load of other opens a whole nother can of worms. Um, yeah, super difficult. I, I I mean, and it's like this is also about how you know how good these devices are. So you know, all well and good that somebody's got an iPad that they can perhaps do a little bit of emailing on, but is that powerful enough to run Excel or to do their job? So I think I think it's going to be a you know famous statement here, but it depends uh, on, and, and ideally, and I think we've talked about this previously, like ideally it'd be uh, good to be able to have a case by case approach, a mm -hmm. very tailored um, to each individual. But isn't, isn't that kind of what option two is? Isn't option two saying, isn't option two saying if you, it's the sort of crown jewels idea, isn't it? Like those who have, those who have access to the most um, sensitive data should have managed, secured, company owned devices 
whereas those who whereas those who who don't 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 need it and it's a good middle way that avoids us having to necessarily spend uh, you know necessarily spend extra money yeah true but I, I don't. I don't think that's. I don't think that's easy enough to do. I mean, there's probably some people with high access to the most sensitive information, but you're sort of relying on organisations having really strict information security controls in place. Mm -hmm. And I like. I've seen that in government. You, you don't. You see it on very sensitive information, but you don't tend to see it on like all information. Like email becomes this treasure trove of sensitive information, and it really is the kind of everybody's got access to email, haven't they? Yeah, yeah, I agree. I, we've just had some feedback from the audience there about you know look for management buy-in around you know m managing um, personal devices with mobile device management software. I think that's a that's a fair call there could be a way of almost building a groundswell of you know we're in the midst of a pandemic we still have to con we still have to keep company data secure you know we are almost asking for you to make that sacrifice so that we can manage your that we can manage yeah. your your device there are benefits inherent to you in that as well like if your device gets lost it can be remote wiped and all that kind of stuff um so what are we going to do basically look are we going to spend the money are we going to spend? Are we going to spend all the money, some money, or no money? A basic, a basically, <laughs> that's the way I see our options. I suppose it's more complex from a security point of view, but that's the way I see our options. Right. So let's see what um what should we encourage people to vote because I think we need a bit of support on this. I'm I'm leaning towards let's splash some cash on this because I've been itching to do digital transformation for a long time from <laughs> remote working. Let's 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 grasp the nettle okay. and buy new devices. I don't oh, know. they've gone the middle way. Yeah, oh, we don't, we, don't, we pushed that too hard, Chris. <laughs> it was too <laughs> it was too rationalised. Okay, I mean, has, I budget oh, has budget. definitely taken a hit, oh, but I think that could, that could have been a lot worse. A, that could have been a lot worse, and B, like, we if we'd have spent a lot of money on that at the beginning, we we would risk not being able to, like, I mean, it kind of says here, like, we might, might not be able to balance cost with other, um, you know, investments that we that we might need to make. That said, clearly our security posture significantly improved, and our operational effectiveness is, you know, is is maintained uh, as an organisation. And so, there we are. There's a. It's something, right? So preparing devices for remote working. Although we made the decision to order laptops for some of our employees to keep our wealthy clients' information secure, the situation progresses much faster than expected. While at work on Monday, the government announces that all citizens must work from home from the following day. The devices you've ordered have not arrived and personal devices still need configuring properly. Which of these measures is most important to take? So these are our options. Either the installation of a remote white facility on all laptops, an action for all staff members to reset their default router admin password, installation of a corporate VPN, this will provide end-to-end -end encryption, enforcing multi-factor authentication, or prohibiting the use of removable. I can't even I can't even read that out without laughing. Prohibiting the use of removable media. I didn't realize it was the early 2000s. Uh, yeah, I love your hatred on removable media. People have <laughs> USB sticks lying around. Are they sticking around? No, uh, what, what, what is anyone plugging them into? There's no ports <laughs> left on any laptops. You can't do anything anymore. Anyway, uh, what are, what are, what are we what are we leaning towards here? Uh, I mean, there's some there's some basic stuff in here, like the like the one you is. If you head and over. Um, um, so it's private uh, use of removable media, multi-factor authentication. Multi-factor authentication yeah. you've hidden, yeah. So I think multi-factor authentication, like this is, you know, we were an Office 365 organization. MFA is literally like the basics, the table stakes for this security game we're in. Mm -hmm. Like if that mm -hmm. wasn't already enabled, I'm like going to throw my toys out of the pram, I think. So like I kind of taken that as a given, although of course it's an option here. I think the interesting debate is kind of VPN, right? So I like the idea of a corporate VPN because my data loss prevention uh, tech can now start working again. So if I can get that VPN in and I can force, you know, um, only access to our corporate mm. software yeah. over that VPN. Now I've actually brought in some of my additional security tools back in, um, right. which kind of makes me feel a little bit more warm and fuzzy about this kind of crazy uh, network infrastructure we've now uh, designed. <laughs> Okay. Um, I mean, I, I so for for what it's worth, it feels to me like 
if we already have Office 365, flicking that button to turn on that um, two-factor authentication feature should be fairly straightforward and cost effective right i mean everyone's okay. got everyone's got a phone everyone's got you know what whatever whatever the second factor is we're also getting a little bit trolled in the questions so only posh laptops don't don't have usb <laughs> ports anymore chris so <laughs> they've, they've obviously exposed us oh. for the macbook pro users that we are oh, my and... last laptop was a dell and it didn't have any ports either and then somebody's pointing out that it's a little bit ropey putting untrusted devices on your VPN as well. So there's a case in point there um, mm. uh, for not doing that. Um, I think I don't, this default router admin password. I like I'm kind of ignoring that because that's kind of like funny, but but probably not the most important thing for us to do. Um, and remote wipe. I'm really kind of sketchy on that. Like I'm I don't know whether I take you know, my data, my company data is important, but the pictures of the kind of long lost grandma that you've stored on your laptop and not backed up to the cloud, like I don't want to be responsible for wiping those. So I'm kind of a little bit like sketchy about uh, remote and, and wiping. And also it's like hard disk encryptions there is standard now, isn't it? I mean, that's a, that's like a given. On your on your personal devices though, do people install BitLocker? It's such a pain. Uh, I thought it turned I thought it turned itself on. So I've, uh, yeah, I guess it. I, I'm thinking about corporate devices, I suppose. But yeah, if it's mm. a personal device, then maybe they haven't. Gosh. So I think we're we're between stick the VPN on. Yeah. With or multi factor Or do multi factor. Okay, let's have a look. See what the audience see has what got to people say. are saying. Oh, almost uh, less. Oh, the, same, the same team. <laughs> so, we need I more think... people voting to break the deadlock. Count every vote. <laughs> Contro controversial. Right, let's go for multi-factor then. Oh, sorry, count every legal vote. Sorry, balance. <laughs> okay. Oh, Good answer. Apparently. Great Good. answer. You need to ensure your cloud service or any collaborative environments are secured with strong passwords and multi-factor authentication. Whatever your method of ensuring security, users should have to validate their identity at least twice. If the password to your VPN is compromised, your entire network is compromised. The other great thing I love about this is we made back a little bit of money. Just a tiny, just a tiny, tiny amount. Yeah. Yeah, yes. <laughs> okay, we are now a week into operating as a fully remote workforce. So far, it seems as though the company is adapting well to the new normal of working from home. There have been some sound issues on company laptops. Can you hear me? Are you <laughs> muted? And various questions about IT equipment. You check in regularly with the IT support team in order to triage any uh, issues. And I think this is basically saying, kind of saying any trending issues. In a meeting, one of the support staff points out that there have been a few reports about suspicious emails from staff members. It's also pointed out that there have been quite a number of complaints about VPN issues. People are saying the VPN has been slow and this is hindering their ability to work. So we can take a quick look at these uh, emails. The first person here is emailing to say, I received an email that appears to be suspicious. Is there a place I can report it? Uh, I think I've installed the VPN correctly, but it's now incredibly slow. Uh, and then this kind of this is the help desk view, so we can kind of see a mixture of where these uh, where these are. Not as many suspicious email as as VPN issues, but anyway, let's see what our our options are here. Okay, investigate the VPN issues. You need to understand what is making the VPN slow. Um, send out communications about suspicious emails. Take no action yet. You're only in the first week. There are bound to be teething troubles. So what are we thinking here? I feel like you're going to say option three. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, I mean, I'm in, I'm in my uh, IT manager role here, not not the CPA role. So uh, mm. I think this is a question designed uh, to really wonder about the kind of usability issues here. So I'm I'm erring towards the suspicious emails because security is more important at this point for me. I think the VPN issues, a, it's slow, but it's not broken. So I'm kind of like, I'm happy to like be like, well, let's, you know, pull, put a few more hamsters into the wheel to keep the VPN <laughs> going, but it's not down. So it doesn't get my priority. These suspicious emails though, that feels like it's, they feel dodged to me. 
so the suggestion is if the vpn was obviously if the vpn wasn't working that would yeah, be right. a more fundamental challenge but because it's only because it's only slow in this context i suppose the other thing is you have to remember if we put ourselves back in the when the new normal was the new normal and not just normal um there was uh there were clearly a, a flurry of um uh, you know uh, threats and or um criminal groups who were looking at ways particularly of um targeting uh, those who were working remotely uh, so there was kind of a spate of pandemic focused um spam and stuff like that so there were there was nefarious stuff going on that increased the risk perhaps from a suspicious email the other thing that it would occur to me is that of course we don't have the same level of visibility perhaps as we did when those right. machines were connected inside a sort of traditional inside the fence network um which of course I, is, a, is a different is a change right and i think there's something about the loneliness or the isolation of working at home i think people like you might have in pre, you know in previous times you got a dodgy email and say hey hey janet janet have you got this weird email from you know finance asking us to transfer money like mm. or like oh has anybody else got this new like two-factor authentication sign-up process thing like th yeah. those kind of things you don't have those conversations and so I, and, and and we know kind of hindsight's uh, you know 2020 but i think it's also it's been <laughs> is, that an, is that an intentional uh, yeah. Yeah, nice. no it wasn't uh, so, that was off the cuff chris um <laughs> the uh the fact that in with hindsight we can see all of these uh mm. pandemic related phishing scams that uh really like played in particularly targeting Office 365, frankly, with those of like separate vulnerability. So I think if we'd have been super smart, like of course mm. we are, we'd have thought email is going to be the most uh, prolific attack vector, big vulnerability. Let's really dial up education and uh, awareness on suspicious emails. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I have a feeling I kind of know what the answers are going to be here from the, uh, from the audience, but let's have a look. Yeah, they've gone. They've taken, with us. The, they've taken well, the same route. Yeah. Okay. Good answer. Flatten the curve on the old budget there. Very good. <laughs> Very good. Security's up. Operational effectiveness probably has just shallowed a little bit there, given that we are now asking them to read emails from us about not clicking, about not clicking spammy links. Clicking so good emails. answer. Yeah, even though our new remote working policy includes information on phishing emails, humans are always vulnerable to error. Drawing attention to emails currently targeting individuals and reiterating the suspicious email reporting process will make our workforce more secure. So that's good news. Right. Staff need to know how to identify and report phishing emails. If there have been reports about suspicious emails, it's likely that others in your organization are getting them, but not reporting them. You enlist the help of HR to send communications about malicious emails. And you also note that for those employees who had already received malicious email, but did not report it, an amnesty will be set up to report them with no repercussions. We get a message from one of our senior consultants, Terence. He has recently received an email, which seemed to be from the company with updated information about the pandemic located in a SharePoint file. To access this file, he was taken to a Microsoft Office 365 login page. He did put in his details, but has noticed nothing suspicious since. However, he's concerned now after recent communications. What do we do? Oh, so option one, option one, do nothing. He hasn't noticed anything suspicious since he clicked the link, so maybe nothing has happened. Option two, tell Terence to change his passwords and keep and to update his inbox's spam filters. Terence need to keep his account secure. Option three, punish Terence. Amnesty, shmamnesty. This employee clearly clicked a malicious link and then didn't inform anyone. Okay, so let's open the voting. Um, are we are we gonna i'm not sure how we're punishing him it doesn't actually say punish terence by removing his web browsing rights for a week i don't know what we're what we're supposed to do to poor terence to be honest oh dear i mean worst nightmare isn't it i clicked it but i clicked it a few days ago or like oh oh and i'm just gonna let you know uh i mean we can't like we literally can't do nothing now we've been told we can't do nothing so i'm throwing one out the out the uh yeah. i'm throwing one out like punishing him feels a little bit heavy-handed uh, but given that, that is that... in fairness that is an extremely effective way to raise awareness 
I mean, every, if you punished him, as someone has suggested in the in the uh, in the questions, we should um, we should publicly shame him by putting his photo on the internet. And that <laughs> is, to me, that seems like a really effective way of doing security awareness. Be aware that if you click fishy links, you will get named and shamed on the company internet. I mean, I've seen some of the like some of the phishing scams that are available. It they are. It, is super hard to spot that they're that they're actually yeah. fishing. Some of them the are really, ones. really good. Yeah. Some of them are so good. Like you'd run out of staff pretty quick, wouldn't you? Like with some of the more advanced ones. I think we like right now at this point, the very first thing we need to do is like plug the hole. Let's change the passwords. Let's get the kind of let's get this get the spam filtering in. I mean, maybe if we even could put something upstream like a mimecast or whatever to sort of try and like help us out with this but like like i i think punishing is too soon i'm you know maybe i'm a bit too soft um but i think it's changes passwords let's do some investigations about what the impact has been some other um some other interesting input from the audience in the in the questions um panel uh, one point one someone pointing out that my plan to publicly shame them would obviously mean that less people would come forward which is a very oh, good yeah. point very astute, very astute that's men. the end of your um, dictatorship there Chris. <laughs> but this but someone else has said actually you could you could name them but you could name them and reward them for coming forward in order to encourage other people to come forward if they'd experienced something similar which i actually thought was quite a <laughs> was quite a good idea they almost like they get a badge for letting us know well, even if it was two days late and you didn't tell us at the time so everybody starts clicking on phishing links just to get yeah, more just keep reward. Yeah, just to get more badges. Got 10 this week. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's have a look and see what the audience is is saying. Yeah, clearly it's option two. <laughs> oh, <No. Okay. laughs> it's obviously no bullies in the audience. They're all too nice. So ensuring that obviously our anti-phishing protection is optimised will block most um, most phishing attacks and suspicious emails from reaching inboxes. Um, there are also um, some spe there's specific advice from Microsoft if we're using Office 365, so we can look to implement some of that. The most important thing is to obviously strike a balance between blocking phishing emails and allowing legitimate business emails. We need to have a process in place that enables them to review blocked emails and release uh, if necessary. It is absolutely essential that password is changed after they receive um, uh, uh, or click on a on a suspicious link. So our security is taking a bit of a dip here, as well as our operational effectiveness off the back of all this uh, all this email shenanigans. So we call Terence and instruct him to change his password. We use this information to optimize our anti-phishing protection. Our IT department should then immediately focus on what to do about this um, suspicious application, potentially. Um, so should we call the affected users to see if they have any uh, information about uh, what this particular uh, malicious application or potentially malicious application might be. Should we go to the incident response plan? We should have an incident response plan in place and it will give us steps for dealing with an incident like this. Um, or do we begin the process straight away to just remove the application? It's most likely doing something suspicious. We should just get it off, um, get it off these uh, these uh, machines. So what do we think? <laughs> I kind of like the idea that we'd have the time to consult the incident response plan. So <laughs> dodgy application spotted. Let's dust dust off the incident response plan, scroll to page six and uh and get get on with it. That's what Well it's the, it's the tricky thing about um like because you know, every organization would be encouraged to have a plan. Mm. And in some cases, and in some cases, this might be flagged you know flagged as an as an incident proper in many organizations there is a difference between you know the moment where you go to the plan is when something is maybe a um you know a uh, a major incident or an incident requiring the incident response team therefore multiple stakeholders you know involving all of the involving all of the right people um whereas the argument might be in this case this is a thing that at least the the it department at least in the first instance could look to address and if it turns out that this uh, this is a wider problem that would you know constitute a more serious incident and therefore require the bringing together of the incident response team i think that you know that potentially is a is a better way to think about it i think but i think you're right you, the point that you're making is is kind of true in that the risk is that if you if you're wedded so much to the plan you're not able to to make a sort of you're not able to make quick decisions in that very small window that you have to yeah. potentially 
make a difference or stop something or prevent something and so it's a it's a bit of a that's a bit of a balancing act in itself isn't it yeah i think the problem i guess the, the thing i was kind of being a bit tongue-in-cheek about with the incident response fund is the likelihood of it handling this particular bespoke scenario that mm. oh you know people are working remotely during like has it been updated when was the last time it was exercised like etc yeah. like i think the point is though i guess and you're extreme ex exactly right like my instinct to like go bowl in start deleting the application destroys mm especially if you do it clumsily destroys any of the forensic evidence uh, that yeah. could be available uh prevents us uh you know if we were to approach the authorities to sort of get them to prosecute or to help understand what the impact's been uh, mm -hmm. the, you know we could have lost data so we don't really know what the impact's going to be on this kind of uh, situation so i guess like my instinct is to go in and delete the uh the application but that's from an it management perspective mm -hmm. rather than perhaps from the kind of CSA handle the incident appropriately perspective yeah good for, um some good, great feedback actually in the in the questions um uh, panel here about how if the it team you know act unilaterally and it's found that it was a bigger issue than before the damage might have already been done at that point, whereas um, bringing the incident response team together or enacting the incident response plan um, may have been able to deal with it just as just as quickly. Um, and we haven't really talked about option one. What about the idea of you know, trying to get more information from um, other affected users before making a decision about how to next respond? This feels like a kind of kick it, kick the can down the road kind of uh, option, and I'm I feel like I want to do something a bit more active than this, like calling the effective users. I don't know what I'm going to ask them. I'd hope that I've got logging and some yeah. sort of, especially if, it, if this has been on a corporate device. I'd probably want I probably want to just start to do the kind of analysis from a central perspective rather than just simply calling up uh, users and asking them what their experience was. Well, it's interesting. It feels like we're it feels like we are kind of split on 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 this feedback from the audience. Bit, yeah. There may be a split as well. So it'll be interesting to look Let's at see. the um, responses now and see. Oh, there you are. You see, so it was it was split. That's really interesting. I also, I wonder whether some of this might be affected by um, the nature of uh, the organisation that you work in. There, there is a suggestion that a larger uh, organization with a more defined incident response plan it may be that referring to the incident response plan is a thing that's done fairly regularly in order to define how to respond whereas perhaps a smaller organization where you know that's looking to that where it are responsible for lots of things and perhaps it's more likely that they would mm. they would go with option three so in this so in this case you get the casting vote anyway so what are you thinking well, I think the, the audience have gone for a cheeky suggestion that calling the affected users would be part of the incident response plan. So why don't we say option two on balance because calling would be part of it? Uh, option two then. Yeah. Okay. Okay, good answer. An up-to-date, comprehensive and recently tested incident response plan would be the best document to refer to. However, the utility of this Will depend on whether you've prepared such a document eh? <laughs> and whether it has been reviewed and tested regularly reviewing and practicing the steps of your incident response plan will help you prepare for an incident such as this it did have a good impact on our security posture that answer um so that's good news it turns out our incident response plan lacks the detail and is painfully out of date hasn't been updated since 2015 so all the people amped up the incident response plan there and that's what you get <laughs> I'm just <laughs> Obviously, I'm joking. Um, so what do we do now? Do we begin the process to remove this malicious application? Do we use this inadequate response plan and amend it as we go? Or do we convene the incident response team? We'll open the voting. I mean, well, it, then, so it, it feels to me as though, so we can't, in a way, it's hard for us to convene an incident response team when we know the plan that we would work to is not useful to us. Yeah, I, I guess know. we're sort of imagining here, like it's like, call the incident response team leader. Oh no, he quit four years ago. Or like, like if the response plan's out of date, then I, I guess I don't really want to be updating the documentation as I keep go. An incident response team. I mean, do we have any faith in them, given that the the plan's out of date? 
Well, no, that was sort of my, <laughs> that was kind of my point. Um, if the incident response plan from 2015, and it's saying to bring together a load of people who are in that plan, the potential is that the people who are in that plan have never looked at it. So, so I, I'm, I'm more than yeah. ever um, leaning towards Seems option one, option because one. the risk yeah. is that option two just ends up as being wheel spinning, doesn't it? I think people, like, people in the questions are also suggesting that like to move at speed is important, which I think I mm -hmm. completely agree with. Like the idea that this malicious application that's been downloaded as a result of some of these phishing campaigns, like it, likelihood that it's ransomware or doing something, mm. you know, uh, something that could do some damage, exfiltrating some of our data. I kind of want to get it, I, you know, instinct is to get it, get it out. Um, what else are people saying? Yeah, same, same. Yeah. Somebody's basically your point there, same Chris. thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Acting, acting would be better. And so basically, one person saying acting is better, another person saying acting fast is is better. So let's see what the um what the votes look like. Yeah, in fact, everyone has now lent in that direction. Okay, so let's have a look. It's vital to remove malicious applications from your network. However, without investigating exactly how these applications were downloaded, you'll miss out on vital information for detecting and blocking further installations, risking a long game of cybersecurity whack-a-mole. Following a structured, tested incident handling process, such as that detailed by NIST, is the best approach in these circumstances. You need to move from containment of the malicious application to eradication and recovery. I mean, the good news is we haven't spent any more money. Um, so, you know, there's that. Great. The Christmas party still on. <laughs> so we decide to immediately remove the application from affected devices. We managed to do this, but we don't know whether any data was exfiltrated from our system. So what do we do next? Do we let any potentially affected clients know we need to prepare them in case their data is used negatively? Do we tell the regulator? Do we tell law enforcement or do we investigate further? I feel like we can answer this very quickly. I mean. I'm, we don't know anything, um, so we've got to investigate further, don't we? It's a little bit, tr it's a little bit panicky to go to yeah, the regulator. You're almost saying like someone's clicked the link. We don't know if anything's happened, but we're going to report a crime. I think that, I think that those first three are for the sake of speed. Those first three are all off, the, all off the table. Um, it feels, it feels like the only thing that we can do is actually investigate what this thing. Um, what this thing might be and then whether any data has been exfiltrated. So and enough people have voted, I think, at this point, and uh, yeah, the, the vast majority there headed to investigate further. Okay. Good choice. Once you've completed containment, eradication, and recovery, it's vital to move to post-incident protocol, including collating data and document documenting the incident to prevent a recurrence. And again, there's some guidance there that we can follow that will help us do that. Okay, before you can begin investigating further, a former colleague who now works for a major bank emails you with some important news. Information about one of your wealthy flagship clients investment portfolio now appears to be for sale on the dark web. Great. Um, so this is an email from our, our, our mate Dan. He's telling us that one of our clients info has gone online. And then here's the screenshot from Darknet Data showing us these uh, transactions and shady shady investments. Okay, so what are our options here now? Do we tell the regulator? Do we tell the police? Do we validate the information? Or do we bid for the data? We need this data off the internet, so we should buy it. Okay, well, okay. listen, there's... Listeners to the podcast will know that I'm always in favour of throwing a bit of money around at uh, criminals to get uh, get our data back, uh, but it feels a little bit premature, um, again, to tell the regulator of the police or to try and buy this data, because we just mm. don't know that that data came from us. All the only data points that we have in this whole story are that we've had a phishing scam and a dodgy application. We've not done any investigation of what that uh, application has done. And now we've got a new data point that some, somebody's found one of our clients data on the dark web. Like it's circumstantial at best, this evidence at this point. <laughs> someone is I... in fact say someone in the someone in the questions is saying fake news, in fact. And I think that well, what's interesting so yeah. is the point, isn't it? The the existence of the data, wherever it exists, is not proof of a breach. Only a breach is only like a, a breach is proof of a breach, if you see what I mean. So whilst that data might be available in that place for some reason, we can't connect those two things at this point. So we have to we have to first of all validate 
we have to know that we are the source of that information, either based on the behavior of that malicious application or um, based on the, you know, on, on some other factor that shows us, yes, this information, you know, should have been completely secured and definitely came from us. Hmm. I think validating the information feels like the only yeah. option here for me. Let's see what the audience has to say. Yep, all gone with that. No, nobody's bidding uh, yet. Oh, that's, uh, <laughs> all that this money left in our budget. So as, as the as the person you pointed out, fake news, you know, just taking your friend's statement at face value could mean admitting culpability to a data leak that isn't attributable to you. You should investigate and confirm whether the data has in fact come from you. You validate the data. It appears the leak to the dark web stemmed from your initial incident. You inform your entire client list so that they can be on the lookout for further malicious activity. Having contained, removed and reported the threat, you now need to ensure that you are prepared for any similar incidents in the future. Which of these is most useful? Option one, review your security awareness program. Staff error caused this incident. This can be rectified. Option two, update the acceptable use policy. So it should set out which applications must not be installed on corporate devices. Option three, invest in new technologies. More preventative technical controls and technologies could have helped you here. Option four, none of the above. The attack circumvented the VPN, multi-factor authentication, and other security tools you already had in place. It was just bad luck. I'm gonna open the voting. Okay, so what do we think? I mean, this is this is the uh, like security nightmare, isn't it? Like, I I don't know that we can really blame the staff for this. A staff error caused the incident. This could be mm. rectified. Like, yeah, okay, maybe they wouldn't. Maybe that one person who got that training last year, like, may or may not have clicked that link. But, but really, like. The system security that has installed that application, like that feels wrong to me. The security didn't stop that email getting into the inbox in the first place. That feels wrong to me. So I'm, you know, I kind of like the I like the idea that we could do that, but realistically, I also think we ought to be investing in some new tech here. <laughs> you would say that. Well, we we <laughs> haven't spent quite enough money for you. We saved all that money on buying brand new brand spanking new mobile devices for everyone right at the beginning of the pandemic so now you want to spend that money on another ai machine learning firewall or that's whatever exactly it, right yeah that's, <laughs> that's what i want <laughs> <laughs> um i think uh, that one of the other interesting things here is that of course yes you know you can always make the argument that some new technology could help I think what's interesting about this this particular situation is that it did bypass a couple of layers of yeah, existing security and so the argument might be that whilst you could put something in that would address directly address that um that that problem then you are a little bit back to the whack-a-mole thing because the next attack vector will just find a way around around that thing um so i, I think this could have been, I suppose lots of lots of companies say this post-incident, this could have been a lot worse than it was. Um, I suppose we have to ask ourselves the question, do we believe that um, adding extra layers of security that significantly reduce the risk of client data being leaked enough do they add it does it add enough of a layer that we think it's worth spending that that money I guess is the is the bottom line is the bottom line I guess, I guess what we also say though is when we're not saying for we're not saying ah like bad stuff happens like mm. we tend to prevent it like sh like shrug shoulders that speaks to me to a poor security culture it says you know we've, it feels like we need to be doing something to improve security mm. whether it's to invest in our people to make sure that they understand uh, and be that first line of defense or whether it's to add more tech or whether it's to change our AUP but uh, fundamentally we're not saying do nothing mm, yeah so let's see what the ah, it's really interesting security awareness has, yeah. has taken the which i guess you know i suppose in it in the in the argument that there were potentially could be a repeat of this you know there and, and actually also if we've understood looking at the nature of our business that our greatest vector for attack is 
are phishing links and in many cases that that is that is true you know either option one or option three would give us an opportunity to be proactive about that either from the perspective of encouraging you know staff to look more closely before they click or by putting something automated in place that you know that might help to that might help to add an extra layer of protection so uh, yeah I, I would say that either of those are you know reasonable moves to make but we were able to take option one without having to spend any more money um this is a good option regular security comms comprehensive awareness program supported by senior management empowering employees to respond appropriately will be, will be more um more effective i suppose the argument will be and maybe this is research that someone wants to do one day um would be to line up security awareness programs against um you know technological solutions and perhaps try to find a way to see which of those is actually most uh, which of those is actually most effective Okay. Someone making a very good point in the in the uh, questions also that that security awareness is a layer of security, which is obviously true. It's just not a not a technological layer in this case. Okay. Oh, we've come to the end. We've, to the we've end. finished on time, which is always <laughs> uh, which is always good. Um, uh, thanks to those of you who um, who got involved uh, through the through the questions pane and also through the uh, and also through the the interactive part of the uh, of the exercise. Hopefully you've um, hopefully you've enjoyed that. Um, as Mitch mentioned in the chat, if you're interested in if you're somehow interested in hearing more of me and Paul, <laughs> uh, we're, we're part of a podcast called Cyber Humanity, which you can go and find on all good podcast platforms. And on that shameless plug, I will um, <laughs> hand back over to I will hand back over to Mitch. If we haven't driven you away yet, check out the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically, yeah. Well, we do have a few questions. Uh, time for a few questions that we can slip in here. First question is, what uh, what are the best ways to communicate during an incident? Probably should be part of your incident management plan. But yes, <laughs> yeah, we didn't really we didn't really cover this in the in the scenario, did we? Um, but we talked a little bit about you know. The nature of incident response plans and a lot of times there'll be um you know set windows for um communication and and, and all those kinds of things as part of a more official you know uh, incident management and incident response um plan um what's interesting about the kinds of things that we can do with exercising though is we can throw curveballs into that um so we can basically say uh you know now at this point in the scenario you don't have access to email for whatever reason because hmm. because you you've been crippled by ransomware you now can't communicate via email so how are you going to so how are you going to do that how are you going to approach that challenge or you know someone is at, someone is unavailable your key man is taken out of the exercise what are you going to what are you going to do now um and another thing to, to to sort of talk about the way that these scenarios can be constructed they're entirely customizable so we've delivered a sort of fairly generic you know imagined scenario but actually there is the potential for um, organizations looking to um, use something like this to be able to build their own scenarios inside the platform so that means that it can be very specific to particular challenges that might work as good variables during an exercise for your um, you know for your organization I don't, I don't think it's fair to say that every organization has a different policy on this like i know even highly regulated organizations like banks uh, for example they do have a fallback to what something like as crazy as it sounds whatsapp because at some mm. point if you assume a complete corporate failure you're going to have to fall back on something and even though that's probably not the most secure thing at least you can uh, at least you can still communicate and reach out to your to your staff and, and your people mm. and get important messages out to them yeah yeah uh, next question, I'm curious about this too, is just how frequently should you hold these kinds of exercises? So we we just we recently did some research that highlighted that most organisations, like as in well over 50%, were running um, were running exercises annually. It's our belief though that that's because of the way that exercising is currently done. Most exercising today is paper based, for want of a better definition. It's using PowerPoint and a facilitator, someone who took who would take my sort of role in it um, and they will walk you through the scenario but of course the challenge is there is that means you have to get everyone either in a room physically or on a zoom call all together at the same time to move through the to move through the scenario so that requires a quite a large scale investment of of, of people's time um, and because it is that 
a sort of paper based you build it in powerpoint and then you deliver it it removes some of the flexibility we are starting to advocate uh, uh, we are starting to advocate an approach that's more of what we call micro drilling which is the idea that you can do these kind of short punchy you could even do this on your own as an individual is a good way of test you know going through and testing what decisions you would make um or do it in the way that we've done it as a facilitated exercise or have different input from different people and these are very easy to spin up and very quick to consume and obviously the fact that the storyline branches means that you could actually do the same exercise a number of times and i'll tell you where the branch point was that we didn't take if you choose to go down the vpn route you get very caught up in fixing the vpn and you potentially miss the phishing emails and the and the data breach so there's an example of how the story can breach and where it can pivot uh, sorry can pivot um, and obviously that means the exercises become repeatable um, and that means you can do them more frequently I think I don't know who somebody famous said if something's hard to do do it more often and I think mm -hmm. it could nothing could be further from the truth you don't want incidents but you do want to exercise frequently um, and um, and that's the that's the key yeah that's sure, sure easy to get distracted by problems you know how to solve versus or easy mm -hmm. going that may not be going to help yeah. you in the situation. There's a question here also about the graphs. Uh, why do the graphs keep going down even though you have good <laughs> uh, that's your stock portfolio? That's probably not a good graph, but you know if it's the pandemic, you know infection rate that might be a good thing. But anyway, so you're the the way that I always answer this question is that we are in the midst of a crisis it is highly unlikely that a lot of those graphs are going to go especially things like you know company reputation or um you know if it was something really bad imagine if something really bad and really crippling like like uh, like ransomware or something like that and share price is one of the factors it is not ever really going to go up until that's over um and so therefore the um uh, it's designed to reflect, you know, we want to try and, again, it's flatten the curve, right? We didn't, we managed not to massively overspend in terms of our, in terms of our IT budget. Um, and we should see that as a, we should see that as a good thing, so. Good, um, good. Um, and actually in here we can, um, we can see then, we can review the choices that we made, that we made, um, we can see the number of you know the number of uh, results that we got against uh, against each one and and there are also other ways of looking at um you know how we weighted our confidence in those uh, in those individual answers and and all that kind of stuff so it gives a little bit of extra insight that maybe you wouldn't get with a more uh, with a more traditional tabletop uh, exercise i'm curious too just a question i have is do you ever use this type of approach also with your end users to kind of quizzing to get responses to see what they're, you know, what would you do in this scenario to try to get a feel for, oh, maybe there's some more education there, or we need to change some policies or process or tools. Yeah, anything, any any application like that that you can think of where it involves, you know, um, a decision and giving a rationale for that decision or weighting a confidence in that decision is is possible inside the uh, inside the platform the only real limitation in terms of the scenario is your imagination we've also run other ones of these that are for example ransomware scenarios where we've also embedded technical exercises into the scenario so we reach a point where it's like now you need to reverse engineer the malware recruit the person who can do that job so that you can understand what it is that you're dealing with um, or you know now you need to deploy the decryptor find the right people in your IT team to you know to go through the exercise of deploying the decryptor so you can make it kind of as as high level or as or as granular as you like but it's really all about testing those things to build muscle memory rather than just testing them to go through a fun exercise once a year um, and move on from it kind of like why you do a restore from your backup tapes just to make sure it works right <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah it's an old exactly. reference but you know what i mean well good good we're um near the end here of our time together i just want to make a note too um, i host a something called tech strong tv uh, which is a daily tv show streaming I have tons of people watch it love to have you guys on it and we can have a little bit of fun with this conversation so hopefully you'll consider that yeah um, sounds see, great to make a commitment now but <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, let's move on to our uh, winners, and announcing winners of our gift cards. We have four winners, Chris J, Kim M, Tanya P, and Emma S.
the folks here at securityboulevard.com will reach out to you and let you know how you can get a hold of those uh, those gift cards for you. Well, thank you everybody for joining us today. Just a reminder, we will send out an email with a link to the recording from today. Uh, there's a lot of great content uh, in today's webinar as well as you can check out other things that we have available on securityboulevard.com. We definitely recommend if you enjoyed the webinar today, uh, send a link to the registration page or just a note to uh, one of your colleagues and they can they can view this on demand later so a lot of fun a lot of good things happening here chris pace uh, paul bentham you guys are fantastic enjoy having you talk today thank you mitch thank you very much very good thank you to everyone here for joining us also your time is extremely valuable the fact that you just spent an hour of it with us we're very honored thank you for entrusting us with your time have a good day be safe and be well